Decision making can sometimes feel a little bit overwhelming. You're faced with loads of questions that you've never seen before, like logic puzzles and having to answer a bunch of yes or no questions. And it can be really confusing, especially when you haven't seen a lot of this information before and it's all very new. But what if I told you that you can make decision making your best section? And it's actually one of the easiest sections in the UCAT. The key to unlocking this whole section is just having good technique. In this video, we're going to be covering the good technique and the approach that you need to be having to every single question so that you can answer it quickly and get that really high decision making score. Hi, I'm Loveline. I sat the UCAT last summer, got a score of 2,950 and a score of 800 in the decision making section, only because I was able to have such good technique. I also have free UCAT notes which you can email me for access and check out part one to make sure that you know about all the other question types in decision making too. In this video, we're going to be covering the second half of the question types such as logic puzzles, probability and also going over some key timing tips which are really important to help you do well in this section. Make sure you also check out part one, as in there we go over syllogisms, interpreting information and recognising assumption questions and looking at what decision making actually is and what it's testing. Let's start off with the fourth question type that you can get in the decision making section of the UCAT. These are logic puzzles. Now logic puzzles, they're essentially testing how you think and making sure you try to think outside the box and in a different way to approach the questions. For these, it's very important that you have a good approach to answering them as it's really easy to get confused, get mixed up and just get the answer wrong by the end of it. Now there are a couple of different type of logic puzzle questions. You can get written ones, visual ones and mathematical ones. For all of these, you'll be given something in the stem of the question called a golden clue and I'll show an example on screen of what one of the types of logic puzzle questions can look like. So within these and in the stem of the question you have something called the golden clue. The golden clue is basically your starting point and that is the bit that gives you the most information. Over time with more practice you'll be able to identify that golden clue a lot more easily but by identifying the piece of information that you've been given and working backwards from that will help you to unravel and solve the entire problem. Now let's start off by taking a look at written logic puzzle questions. In these you're often just given a stem which contains information and you're told to work something out. For these it's really important that you use your whiteboard that you're given in the UCAT exam as you're given a whiteboard and a pen to do working out on. Make sure you actually use it because it's so easy to get confused. So if you've been given a question draw out a table, write out the names of the people and the for example if that's what's in the question and write out on the other side of the table the thing that they've got, the thing that they haven't got and just work it out from there. By doing this, it means that you're actually correctly identifying everything in the question and you're not getting yourself mixed up and it's a lot easier to do this than just solving it in your head and you'll be able to do this within the 60 seconds. It is also really important to make sure that you're continually looking back at what the answer options are. So the four answer options, by referring back to them, it means that you're actually doing what you need to do and you're not working out the wrong part of the logic puzzle. For a lot of the questions, you actually don't need to work out the full puzzle. You can just work out half of the puzzle and then you can have your answer. So by continually checking back, okay, what does option A say? What does option B say? By doing this and eliminating them, you can actually reduce your time by nearly half because you don't even have to complete the logic puzzle to get to your answer. So remember that. Now, when you're doing mathematical logic puzzles, these often require you to just make some equations out of them. So the key skill that's often needed here is simultaneous equations or just knowing how to construct an equation from the information given. These aren't as common in comparison to the other two types of questions, but with practice, it becomes easier to just create equations based on the logic puzzle. The third type of logic puzzle that you can get are visual logic puzzles. And in this, you're often given some sort of diagram or some sort of information or picture in which you have to work out the position of different things. For these questions, it's really important to take perspective into account. Your left-hand side and the person in the image's left-hand side may not be the same. The diagram may be orientated in a different way, it may be flipped, so it's really important to think about what perspective you're looking at it from. Maybe you have to mentally imagine yourself standing on the opposite side of that diagram, for example, or rotating it in your mind. And again, this is where your whiteboard is really handy, just to draw out the diagram, for example, and rotate it so that you can visually see it. This is really important so that you are getting the right answer. And again, with these, it's important to remember to use the golden clue method, systematically work it through, and keep continually checking the answer options so that you're not wasting time and completing the whole puzzle when you don't actually need to. The fifth question type that you can get in decision making are Venn diagrams. Now Venn diagrams can come up in a variety of different ways and as shown in the example on screen, you're often given a Venn diagram which has loads of different shapes, it can be quite confusing and loads of overlapping different sections. For all of these different Venn diagram question types, the most important thing is to first actually read what the question says because going straight into the Venn diagram, you don't know what information you need, you don't know what you're looking for and you're just going to waste time if you try to understand what all the different shapes and what the key is trying to tell you. So go straight to the question 
option and look at what the answer options say. Now, the answer options for A to D, all of them will essentially ask you to calculate something on the Venn diagram. And the biggest tip is to go to the easiest calculation first, because if you go to the easier calculations first, then it means that you can solve them much more quickly. And if they're correct, you've just saved loads of time instead of doing them in the order of A, B, C, D. Now, once you've worked out the Venn diagram answer, just select the option, don't bother checking the others and move on. With Venn diagrams, as there's a variety of different question types as well, it's important to remember, just be careful on your approach to each of them. So for some of them, you may be asked uh, to fill in the blank for them. You might just be asked for the total. Or you might be asked what the intersection so shows. So these are just variations of Venn diagram questions. With Venn diagrams, it's also really important to become really good at mental maths. A lot of the time, the numbers are quite small. You're not given massively large numbers most of the time. So if you can become really good at mental maths, it means you're just able to work a lot quicker as a UCAT calculator is quite clunky, it's quite slow and it is difficult to use. So that will really, really reduce the time that you're spending on these questions. And the final question type that can come up in the UCAT decision making section is probability. Probability also comes up a little bit in QR, but it's the idea of what is the likelihood of an event occurring? So what is the chance that something will happen? Now, this is a really important idea and there are different ways to work out probability within a question depending on what it's asking you. So probability is always based from zero to one. So if there's a 0 0.2 probability of something happening, it essentially means there's a 20% chance of it happening. For example, let's say we had a coin. A coin has a 0.5 chance of it landing on heads and a 0.5 chance of landing on tails. So it has a 50% chance of getting either of those two options. Now with probability, depending on what the question is asking you, that is when you need to know whether you're multiplying them or adding them. So if you're being asked what is the likelihood of event A or event B happening, so one or the other, this is when you use addition or subtraction. So you can calculate that because the events are either mutually exclusive, which is why you add the probabilities together. However, if the question says what is the likelihood of event A and event B happening, this is when you multiply the probabilities together because both of these things need to be happening in order to get your answer. Again, for probability, it's really important that you're good at your mental math and I'd also really recommend using your whiteboard again for this or jotting down any information that you're calculating as a lot of the time you'll be given the probability for the opposite thing so let's say for example the first statement might say on Saturday there's a 0.6 uh, chance of it raining and then the second statement might say on Sunday there is a 0.6 chance of it not raining so there you've got two different probabilities and you have to convert them so that either they both say not raining or they both say the chance of raining so again, jotting all these down in your whiteboard will just make it really clear for you and help you to get the answer a lot more quickly. In this section, we're just going to be covering some of the timing tips that are really important for you to know in the decision making section. Starting off with keyboard shortcuts. Now, this is important across all the sections in the UCAT learning. A few really key keyboard shortcuts is what is going to help you to speed up just that couple of seconds, which is such valuable time in the UCAT. So learning how to go to the next question, which is Alt N, going to the previous question is Alt P and pulling up the calculator, which is Alt C. Now, leading on from this, it's also really good to become really fast at using the calculator. So in your actual UCAT exam, you are given a keyboard and on the side of it, you'll have a number pad. So I highly recommend you buy a keyboard so that you can practice all your UCAT um, mocks and subtests on a keyboard. And then regularly practice using the number pad at a fast speed. So you can use skills trainers on different websites like Medify, MedEntry, or just practice doing calculations. The faster you can get at using your keypad on, on the number pad, the quicker you will be at answering questions in the actual UCAT exam on the calculator. The next tip is to become really good at mental maths. Again, pairing mental maths and good calculator skills together just means you can flip between the two skills really easily in the actual exam. Now, my next tip is to make sure you know when to guess, flag, and move on from a question. Typically, interpreting information questions are very content heavy. There's a lot of information to process. There's a lot of things that you have to do within the question, and they can be very, very time consuming. So often, if you're faced with one of these questions, it's recommended that you just guess them, flag the question, move on, and then you can come back at the end where you can dedicate a little bit more time. Over time, the more practice you do, you'll be able to identify, okay, this is a question that I need to skip because it's going to take me too long, or I can quickly do this now within the 63, 64 seconds that I have to answer the question. For questions which you are finding more time consuming, become really good at knowing when to flag them within two or three seconds, move on, and then you can come back later when you can dedicate enough time without compromising the rest of your time on the other sections. 
And also always remember to use your whiteboard in this section. Decision making, because it's so technique heavy, it's really important not to make mistakes. It is quite easy to, especially for logic puzzles and syllogisms, writing everything down on your whiteboard. Your whiteboard is your best friend in this section. So putting everything down on here will help you to organize your working out to every question really easily. But on that note, do not spend loads of time using the whiteboard in the sense that if, for example, the question has five people's names in, you don't have to write that person's full name for all five people. Just write the first letter of all their names. This again will save you time no one is going to check that working it's for your own reference so make sure it's clear to you but do not waste time writing out full names or drawing out really really pretty diagrams just use it quickly and work through it very quickly so you're again you're not wasting time on the actual questions i hope this video was helpful and again don't forget to check out part one where we go over the other question types and look at what decision making actually is as again that will help you please feel free to email me to access my free ucat notes too and check out the rest of my youtube videos as i go into similar detail for all the other the UCAT sections too.